Welcome to Act One. Uh, so, let's see, it started in 1992. I was living in uh, Puyallup, Washington. Uh, some of you may be familiar. It's a small town about an hour's drive from Seattle. Uh, I, uh, my dad was flying C-141s for the U.S. Air Force, and in the spring of that year, he got hired by Alaska Airlines. Uh, so we loaded up in a U-Haul and moved to Anchorage. Uh, shortly after we got here, I, uh, I enrolled at Service High School. I did a lot of activities in high school. Uh, but the thing that I remember the most about my high school experience was falling in love. Uh, yes, this is true. I fell in love with math. Uh, I, uh, you know, I had a neighbor who did a garage sale. They sold a whole bunch of old college math textbooks. I bought like 20 of those things. And it was at that point that I realized there was so much more to math than what I was learning in high school. Uh, so I would just spend hours and hours and hours just pouring through these books. Uh, you know, I probably understood maybe 10% of what I was reading but the passion was there, you know, I, I had to understand more. Uh, so, uh, that's, yeah, so then uh, after that, I, you know, like most kids in my class, uh, I, you know, I graduated, uh, let's see, in 95, and there were, uh, I graduated co-valedictorian. So, you know, I wonder if the Anchorage School District has actually figured this co-valedictorian thing out yet. Uh, you know, I would have been happy to finish second or third, uh, but, you know, actually, I finished in a 15-way tie for first, which, you know, seems, <laughs> seems kind of excessive. Uh, and after graduation, I, you know, I, um, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, get out of, basically, I wanted to get away from home. I mean, this is pretty common, right? And uh, like most kids in my class, I went out of state. Uh, I wanted to go, you know, pursue some freedom, fun, you know, learn some good things. Uh, so unlike most kids in my graduating class, I, I went to a military academy. Uh, I went to the Air Force Academy, and probably the most important thing that I learned while I was there was how to perform under pressure. So, you know, uh, any one of these cadets could stand right here and give this speech today uh, while doing push-ups with someone yelling insults at them about three inches from their face. Uh, so after two years of, you know, pursuing the, uh, the fun and freedom at the Air Force Academy, which, uh, you know, as you can imagine, I didn't really find, I decided to come back home and uh, continue my studies at UAA, uh, and specifically jump back into my pursuit of love of math. So, uh, yeah, so um, let's see. I graduated in 99. The economy was booming kind of throughout the country. It was the height of the dot-com boom. Uh, I felt like there was a ton of opportunities out there for me. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't find them for a while. Uh, but when I finally did, I landed with uh, Alaska Airlines, and I started out as a field tech here in Anchorage, and eventually moved to Seattle to be a software developer for them. Uh, I learned a lot. I wrote a lot of code. Uh, you might recognize this. This is something that I worked on while I was there. Uh, that was a long time ago, in 2003. Uh, after a few years of writing code for them, I decided that uh, I would kind of, you know, polish up my resume and see what else was going on out in the, out in the marketplace. And a recruiter contacted me and hooked me up with this place. So, yeah. You know, there's this expression that, uh, you know, if you, if you say that somebody had a cup of coffee in a place, that means they didn't really stick around very long. That pretty much accurately describes my experience at Microsoft. And as you can see, I, I have the coffee cup to uh, prove it. So after three months at Microsoft, uh, another Seattle tech giant called me. Uh, yeah, Amazon was a pretty cool place. I, I met a lot of great people there, worked on a lot of good stuff. They're really fascinating in that uh, the website itself is managed by hundreds of small teams, and every one of them has a little chunk. Well, that little chunk right there, which is uh, merchant selling, was actually the chunk that I worked on. And, and to be fair, my team was one of only like five or six teams that was responsible for that. So, you know, it's compli complicated stuff. Uh, also, while I was at uh, Amazon, I decided to uh, work on an MBA. Uh, I did that at Pacific Lutheran. Uh, I, I really liked writing software, but I felt like I could do so much uh, more good uh, as a leader, and, you know, and maybe someday start my own company. Uh, so after the MBA was over, I decided to, uh, you know, come back home and try and, you know, leverage the things that I had learned while I was in Seattle, and, you know, bring that stuff back to Alaska. Um, so when I returned, I kind of started questioning, like, well, what was it that caused me to leave in the first place? You know, I didn't have wanderlust. I, uh, you know, I, I didn't really want to go live in the big city. 
And in the end, what I realized was that what I really wanted more than anything was just a fun, challenging, fulfilling job in technology. And that was really hard to find here. Slide, please. You all may recognize this. Uh, it's the famed three-legged stool from alaskaseconomy.org. Uh, it's basically a metaphor that talks about how jobs are distributed in our economy. So roughly one-third are in federal government, roughly one-third in oil, and one-third in kind of everything else. Uh, so if you look at that as a pie chart, it, it looks like this. Uh, when, you, when you actually switch this around and look at it in revenue terms, however, you can see, hmm, it's not quite so evenly distributed anymore. So I thought, you know, it might be fun to actually turn that into a three-legged stool and see what it looks like. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't look too stable to me. I, I'd be a little uncomfortable trying to sit on that thing. Uh, so, you know, and moreover, I'm not really sure how confident I am that those other two legs are going to hold up kind of forever. So there's a, additionally, there's a report that comes out every year that's done by CNBC, which is the best states to do business in. Uh, and this has been consistent for the last three years. Alaska, as you see I've highlighted, is second to last, right, near the bottom in terms of states to do business in, which is amazing when you consider that we're the third best economy of all the states in the country. So the question is, like, well, how is that even possible? You know, I mean, I, I, this is some pretty simple math, but if you average a bunch of stuff together, I mean, you throw the number three in there, you'd figure you'd finish higher than 49th. And really, the answer is that we just do really abysmally poorly at everything else. Uh, and some things are tough to change, like cost of doing business, cost of living, these sorts of things. But some things are actually well within our control to fix, uh, like uh, technology and innovation and education. So, hmm, in kind of thinking about these two things, I think, there's a, I think there's a good relationship. There's a good opportunity here, which is we need economic diversity we're kind of bad in education and technology, what if we use some of the spoils of our good economy to invest in those two things and build a technology sector? That seems like a reasonable idea. So uh, as I think about it, I go, well, okay, let's say we wanted to build a tech sector. Well, we should probably follow an example. Uh, the best example I can think of is Silicon Valley. So I thought to myself, well, okay, geez, how would you go about building a Silicon Valley like right here in Alaska? That seems kind of tough. Fortunately, my, one of my favorite bloggers uh, has written and thought about this a lot. This is uh, Paul Graham. He's a software developer who eventually started a company called uh, Y Combinator, which is like a factory for tech startups. Uh, he says there's only two things that you need to build Silicon Valley. First one is rich people, and the second, nerds. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, okay. So then the question is like, well... Oh, the other thing, the things that you don't need, uh, bureaucrats, they're not going to help you get it done. And uh, buildings, there's this popular misconception that if you just build a big tech park, like startups will magically happen. This one here is the Denver Tech Center. They have a lot of old tech companies like HP and Oracle and SAP there, but no startups. So, yeah, so let's not do that either. Okay, so then the question is, well, like, hmm, how would we get rich people and nerds to come here to Alaska? Jeez, sounds like a tall order. Fortunately, Paul Graham has some advice on this front, too. He says you need four things. The first thing is universities. Great universities. And really, the key there is to attract top-tier faculty, because it's the top-tier faculty that are going to raise the level of the program and attract the top-tier nerds, if you will, who will be the ones that ultimately create the tech startups. Okay, so the second thing that you need is a city with a lot of personality, right? Because after people graduate, they need a place to stay. I mean, the place they want to live and work. And so what you should invest in there is, you know, culture and art and, uh, you know, have a lot of unique things that exist in the environment that, you know, you know young nerds would like. Uh, what they don't like is big box stores and restaurants. Yeah, we're not into that. Uh, what they do like, however, is progressive thinking. So you can be assured that events like TED, TEDx, uh, are right up their alley, so very good. Uh, so yeah, the third thing that you need is time. 
Well, how much time is really tough to say because you know, this thing has to grow organically. Um, but we can draw an example from Boulder. Boulder is actually pretty well recognized as a tech startup hub now. And they really got started about 15 years ago. So that's a good indication of how long it'll take. The fourth thing that you need is competition. You need a reason to be better, like a reason, to, uh, a compelling reason to be better than kind of all of the other cities that do tech startups. So we have to be better than Seattle and Silicon Valley and Boston and wherever else. Um, so, you know, at this point, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, geez, that's a really, like, that's a really, really tall order. I mean, we're going to build a whole tech sector. That seems kind of crazy. Um, and you might be discouraged. I know that uh, when I started thinking about this, I was too. But I have an idea. So I asked myself, well, you know, let's say that we followed Paul Graham's prescription pretty much perfectly, and we built a great tech sector here. Uh, we, would, we would actually solve the problem of economic diversity, but we wouldn't, even be, we wouldn't even begin to think about addressing the other problems that face our state. So in short, what we would end up with is yet another rich guy. Uh, uh, oh, wait, wait, let's, uh, let's eliminate the gender bias from this. Yeah, okay, thanks, that, that's a lot better. So, uh, and it's, you know, you kind of get this, uh, you get this lottery mentality that exists in Silicon Valley, where it's like, well, if you get in with the right tech startup, you know, you, you might get rich. And that's not really what I think we should be shooting for here. Um, what I would prefer to see is happy and healthy Alaskans. So, yeah, that's much better. I mean, I think as an acronym, it works a lot better, too. You know, YARG versus ha ha ha, all right, okay. So, um, there's a, another famous techie who ironically is, lives in Silicon Valley, who says, who says it very succinctly. He says, we should focus on building businesses that are about making meaning and not just making money. So, the simple but powerful message here is that Building a strong and profitable business is not good enough. We need to also build businesses that address the social problems of our communities. The great thing is there is a term for this. It's called social enterprise. Uh, and, and so this is kind of my, this is my proposition, is that what we should build is a tech sector that is based on social enterprise. That's our differentiator. Now, we're fortunate in that there are some hybrid corporate structures that exist uh, we, that, uh, you know, that have come along in the last couple of years, where it's, you're not quite a nonprofit, you're not quite a for-profit, you're something in the middle. The first one is uh, the B Corp, or Benefit Corporation. There are over 500 registered B Corps right now. Uh, the second is the Low Profit Limited Liability Company, uh, or L3C. Both of these are, are similar in nature, and uh, Roughly 11 states, uh, actually, excuse me, exactly 11 states, have enacted legislation uh, that, enable, that have provisions for either B Corps or L3Cs. Uh, and there's one striver in the bunch, Vermont, which has both. Uh, perhaps it should come as no surprise that Alaska is not one of those 11 states. <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah, so social enterprise is hot. This, the next two slides here are from uh, Give to Get. Uh, jobs.com, which is a, a jobs website that hooks up people who are looking for social enterprise jobs with social enterprises. They have over 1,500 registered social enterprises in their database. Uh, I did a little search. How many, how many uh, social enterprises do you think there are that are registered in Alaska? Zero. So, as it turns out, uh, we are not on the map literally or figuratively. Uh, more interesting is if you look at the uh, list of industries where they have a lot of social enterprises registered. You don't see anything about computers, software, technology. Hmm. So I would say, you know, this is clearly uh, an indication of an opportunity waiting to be capitalized on. So what am I doing about it? Well, I'm, uh, I'm the chair of the Health and Human Services Commission for the Muni, which helps me kind of stay uh, abreast of uh, social problems that are facing our community. 
Uh, I'm, I've been asked to be the chair of an advisory board for the computer science department at UAA to try and help bridge the gap between industry and academia. Uh, I'm president of Design PT, which is a, a 20 person IT services company that does IT service for nonprofits. So we're a social enterprise kind of in our own right. Uh, and I also started this event, which is called 3DS Alaska, 3DS standing for three day startup, which is a workshop that helps college students build tech startups. Uh, and you can imagine my surprise and delight when the first startup that came out of 3DS, which happened a year ago, was Gearspoke. Gearspoke is a peer-to-peer -peer equipment rental business where the idea is that, you know, you have skis in your garage that you're not using, you could rent them to your neighbors or other people in town so that, you know, they don't have to go buy their own or rent from, a, you know, an expensive place. So the benefit there, the social benefit, is that you are putting, you know, you're building a better sense of community because you have people running from people, and at the same time, you're improving the utilization of existing stuff, which prevents the need to build new stuff. So it's better for the environment. I can't do all this on my own, so I need your help. And so here's what I ask of you. Please, please, please support investment in our universities. Support the further development of a uniquely Alaskan culture uh, that will attract smart people from the outside. Support activities surrounding tech entrepreneurship like Three Day Startup and Startup Weekend. And support social enterprise and the legislation around it. And with that, I thank you very much for your time.